Well, hey friends, it's Jason here. I'm part of the pastoral team at The Way Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. And before we jump into another message from someone from our teaching team, we wanted to say hello, express gratitude that you take time to engage in this message, and express our heart to strengthen followers of Jesus and to introduce the Word of God and the message of Jesus to all who want to hear. And if you want to find out more about the life of our church, you can find out more online, the links below, or reach out to some of our team members at contact at thewaychurch.ca. We hope this message strengthens your heart, draws you deeper into the Word and love of God, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Enjoy the message. Growing up, my dad worked for an organization called Young Life. And we mentioned the Young Life property, Rockridge. And there's another beautiful Young Life property in British Columbia called Malibu. And Malibu is hidden away in the crevices of the coast. And you have to get there by float plane or by boat. If you go by boat, it looks like a boat ride to Gibson's, a drive up the coast to Egmont, another boat, a couple hours to Malibu. And it's stunning. I have such fond memories of going to this beautiful gem that British Columbians should be proud that we have. And one of my favorite parts was our day trip you could take from Malibu down the Princess Louisa Inlet to Chatterbox Falls. Chatterbox Falls is a waterfall that is known around the world as a destination spot. And as a kid, you don't really appreciate the beauty of what it is. As an adult going back to see it, just overwhelmed, like the feeling of the mist, the sheer force of the water coming down. But one of my favorite things as a child was when we went on these day trips to Chatterbox Falls. And you know kids like can handle cold water? So like I've gone there recently, been like, I'm going to swim in there. I'm like, nope, not happening. But as a kid, I used to swim in all the pools beneath the falls. And one of the most amazing things was uh, you could kind of slide along the rocks from one pool into another as the water cascaded from one pool of water to the next. And what's so interesting about that is these rocks that were probably once chaotic and jaded have been smoothed and brought to an order for the water to flow through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of water coming down those rocks, smoothing them to what a kid could play on almost like a water slide. And today I want to explore the idea that you and I, like the rocks at the base of Chatterbox Falls, have been shaped and formed. We're in a series called Practicing the Way, and at the heart of this series is to lay a foundation of life with Jesus. We want to paint a picture of what it looks like to intentionally follow Jesus, not in a theoretical abstract sense, but in the day-to-day-ness of our life here in the city. We want to explore what it looks like to follow Jesus, to organize our lives around three driving goals, to be with him, to become like him, and to do as he did. And we're doing this series alongside a course called Practicing the Way. And over the last year and a half, I was able to work closely with John Mark and the team at Practicing the Way to form this course, which now thousands of churches around the world are doing, and we've signed up to do it ourselves. So if you're in a small group right now, this week is week two of Practicing the Way. And we get that it's confusing. We've heard the feedback. We're doing a series called Practicing the Way. The course is called Practicing the Way from a ministry called Practicing the Way, but we're the Way Church, but we're not formally connected to Practicing the Way. But strangely, when I go on their website, I see pictures of Dan Smith. Explain all that. (laughs) And that's true. And Rachel Matson as well, because one time they were just getting started, and they're like, do you have any good-looking people that could take photos? And I said, I don't know for sure, but here's a staff directory. And they said, we'll take that one, that one, that one, and that one. Chris and I did not get invited into it. (laughs) And I tell you all this for a few reasons. One, to give context for the series that we're part of. Two, to explain the deep connection between what we're doing on Sundays and our small group. And third, and I mean this seriously, to give a citation. The work that we're presenting, these sermons, if they feel strangely familiar to the course, strangely familiar to the book, we're not trying to sneak something past you. This is a formal citation that with the permission of practicing the way, we're basing the teaching on Sundays deeply in the work of the book and the course. Last week, Chris kicked off the series. This week, 
I am starting part one of a two-part talk. Now, I don't know if we've ever done this formally. We've done series before, but today is a bit of a cliffhanger. Like, you'll come to the end of the talk and feel like, and, and it is maybe good to get people to come back to church in future weeks. We don't typically trade in those kind of gimmicks, but every now and then, it doesn't hurt. But also just because this conversation on formation that we want to have needs to be done patiently and thoughtfully. So in, very, in, in a very real way, today is part one of a two-part series on formation that we'll finish two weeks from now. Today we're talking about formation. And the primary text we're going to look at this morning is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And if you've got a Bible handy, you can grab it and flip there. We'll also have it on the screen. Here's some context that I want you to have. What we're reading in Romans chapter 12 is a portion of a letter written by the Apostle Paul to young Christians living in Rome. Let's talk about Rome for a moment. Rome in the first century is the greatest city in all of the world. It is the epicenter of art philosophy, religion, and culture. To say that Rome was a cultural force is an understatement. Like, think about the cultural cities of our world today. London, Paris, Tokyo, New York. In 1901, a surgeon in New York wrote a book because he observed that people who lived in Manhattan carried certain character traits, so he wrote a book wanting to coin a term called New York-itis. Now, there was a little bit of satire in it, but he identified a pattern, a condition in people who lived in Manhattan that he called New York-itis. He noticed patterns of haste, of restlessness, and anxiety. I have a dear friend who moved to New York years ago, and he would testify to the degree to which the city has shaped him. I felt that here in Vancouver. I've been part of the city for five years deeply, and I've been shaped, not just in external things I wear, although that's part of it for sure, but actually in my value structures, the pace at which I move, how I relate to people. And to try to compare Rome to London or Paris or Tokyo or New York or Vancouver would still be an understatement. And the church in Rome is just getting started. Paul's writing in the year approximately 57. Christianity is less than 30 years old. It's a young movement. It's fledgling movement. And all of a sudden, these men and women are gathering as followers of Jesus in the cultural epicenter of the world called Rome. And Paul writes to them to instruct them on how to be followers of Jesus in a world that is not oriented in the direction of the ways of Jesus. And he says this in chapter 12. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your whole self, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Notice the two verbs, conform, transform. Both verbs are from the same root word in Greek, metamorpheo, which is where we get the English word metamorphosis. So the picture that likely comes to mind is tadpole becoming a frog, caterpillar becoming a butterfly. And one lexicon defines it as a change in the essential form or nature of some thing. Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. These are two distinct pathways. One pathway, the patterns of this world. The second pathway, the way of Jesus. And these are more than externals that Paul's after. Paul's speaking to the fundamental substructures, the motivation, the ethics, and the values that shape the way we inhabit the world. And in the rest of chapter 12, Paul will lay out a series of instructions as if to describe what it looks like to offer your whole selves in worship. And that's an interesting thing to consider. What does it mean to offer my whole lives? Like not just my singing on Sunday, but my whole lives. And here are some of the things he hits in the rest of chapter 12. Be humble. Prefer others. Don't give in to comparison. Love in an authentic and consistent way. Turn from all that is evil. Take hold of firmly the things that are good. Be generous and open-handed. Be hospitable and welcoming to neighbor. Don't take revenge, but respond to hate with blessing and love. 
nothing like Rome. Paul gives this list of instructions after saying, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed into a whole other way of being in this world by a renewed mind through the power of the Spirit. And then he begins to outline things that look nothing like Rome. Two paths, the way of this world or the way of Jesus. I love how J.B. Phillips put it. He said it this way, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but instead be transformed. Follow a different path. And this invitation that Paul gives to Christians in the first century in the cultural force, the formation machine that is Rome, is the same invitation that stands before you and I today. Don't conform to the patterns of this world. There's a different way to live. Follow the way of Jesus. And so today I want to just answer three questions. Actually, more than answer three questions, I want to pose three questions that I hope that you would reflect deeply on. Three questions I want us to reflect on today. Number one, what, are you, what is forming you? What forms you? What has made you the man or woman you are today? And what is making you the man or woman you're becoming? Question number two, what are you being formed into? What is the trajectory of your formation? And number three, third question, are you intentional about the way you're being formed? So question number one, what's forming you? What's forming you? No single person in this room, or the whole world for that matter, is a carbon copy of another. It's so stunning. Each one so uniquely made and wired by the living God. God built each of you with a unique set of features, traits, and wiring. And each person is emotionally and psychologically unique as they are physically unique. It's a stunning wonder. But who you are today is not just a product of your wiring or your DNA. We're formed. We've all gone through a process and will continue to undergo a process of formation. In other words, every single person who has ever lived has been spiritually formed. To quote Practicing the Way, Mother Teresa was a product of spiritual formation and so was Hitler. Their spirits were formed over a long period of time through a complex alchemy of genetic inheritance, family patterns, childhood wounds, education, habits, decisions, relationships, environments, and more. And the same is true of you and I. We have been formed, we're being formed, and will continue to be formed for the rest of our lives. Now, here's what's interesting. No one here sets out one morning or one month or a New Year's resolution, and it's like, my New Year's resolution this year is to conform to the patterns of this world. (laughs) That would be a strange one. It happens without our consent. It happens without our opting into the process. It happens naturally. And so what I want to do is just name a few of the things that form us. Not all of the things, it's not an exhaustive list. But in order to help us think critically about what in our lives has formed me and is forming me, I want to name a few. Number one, we're formed by our relationships. Our relationships, our family of origin, our closest friends, the teachers we had growing up, and the people we work with, they all shape us. And this is to some degree intuitive, like, especially when it comes to family of origin. For better or for worse, I and you are a product of the family we grew up in. The way we communicate, the way we solve problems, the way we argue, the way we celebrate what we celebrate, the way we feel loved, is in large part shaped by the family we grew up in. But as we age, the relational ties, they change. And though we still very much are shaped and formed by our family, there's new relationships that enter the scene. Friendships, romantic relationships, mentors, colleagues. And these relationships form us deeply as well. You've likely heard the figure of speech, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I want to suggest that it could be said, show me your friends and your family of origin and I'll show you your value structures, ethical convictions, and communication style. It doesn't flow off the tongue as quickly, (laughs) but we're shaped by our relationships. We're also shaped by our habits. We're formed by habits, the usually unconscious things that animate our lives. 
James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, has been on the New York Times bestsellers list for the last 250 weeks. His core premise, tiny changes, repeated action, lead to remarkable results. I think he would argue that to ignore your habits is to ignore one of the strongest forces in your lives. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. And Charles Duhigg in his book, Power of Habits, argues that our most basic actions are not the result of well-considered decisions. See, so many of us think that we move through the world calculating each decision we make, but it's not true. Most of the decisions we make, the actions we take, are the result of habits that we don't even realize we have. Now, to be clear, whether it's relationships or habits or other factors we're talking about, I'm not making a moral statement about whether they're good or bad inherently. I'm making an observation about how humans are made and wired. Some habits are good. Brushing your teeth, a good habit that 98% of you did this morning. It's great. That's great that in the morning you don't sit and go, should I brush my teeth today? The habit is doing some good work for you. This morning, right before I left, I leave early on Sundays, Hudson ran out of his house, out of his room, and I saw him without thought. We both instinctually moved towards one another, embraced. I kissed his head and I said, I loved you. I didn't make the decision. I didn't have to decide if I thought that was a good use of my time this morning. It's a habit that we've built day in, day out. And I'm so thankful for that habit. I'm thankful for the habit of turning my mind to Christ when challenging moments are facing me. These are good habits. Some habits are less good. Checking the phone first thing in the morning to see what happened in the news or who's demanding your time or what problem you need to solve before you've even had a chance to think about one good thing about living in our Father's world every day. Before the thought can enter your mind that I'm alive today because a good God decided I should be alive today, we're bombarded by things that demand our attention. Rehearsing the stresses of tomorrow before going to bed at night, an unhelpful habit. Reaching for a glass of wine or food to cope with stress that you face through work, a less helpful habit. Our thought patterns, our actions are in large part governed by habits that connects to all kinds of stimuli in our lives. We're also shaped by the content we consume. Books, movies, music, films, The steady stream of content served up by the complex algorithms of our social media platform of choice. All of these pieces of content, they shape us and they form us. Recently, I was chatting with a good friend about a public figure, not Donald Trump, a different public figure. And uh, our opinions on this public figure that neither of us have ever met were polar opposite. And I assume that we would have the same perspective on this individual. And so as we're chatting, I'm trying to work out, like, it's pretty disorienting when you think something is obviously true. And this has happened all the time in the political discourse and the global conversations where you're like, amongst you and your close friends and in your world, you're like, well, this is obviously, this, is a, this guy might be problematic, but he's doing good for the world. And then to talk to somebody else who's like, that person is evil and their intent is bad. It's so disorienting. And as we talked more about it, what I discovered is his algorithm and my algorithm are feeding us up a consistent drip of content about this individual that are fundamentally different. And we got to take pause on this reality because we really, as Vancouver educated, thoughtful, smart, culturally nuanced, discerning people think, man, I've got a great perspective on the world. But to sit across the table from someone you respect and to realize that we're both fundamentally a product of the content we've consumed in the months that led to that conversation is humbling. I remember when my daughter Mary was really young, she's watching a Disney movie on VHS. Not because I'm that old, but because... um, We thought it was like kind of cute and nostalgic. We were like trying to decide if our kids should have access to the internet or not. So we're like, but VHS, that's safe. And uh, and we had these old you know movies that my mom took from the attic and said, hey, we're not storing this anymore. You can have it. And uh, she was watching a Disney movie and she came running out of her room and she said, I need a prince, Dad. (laughs) And I was like, you do not need a prince. (laughs) You are strong, woman. 
you're capable, you're loved. You don't have to go searching for love. You know, I'm just speaking like, where did this idea come from, you know? And I don't think we should stop our kids from watching movies about princesses that fall in love with princesses. Maybe, but that's not the point I'm making. Because I feel like the counter argument would be, well, one movie's harmless. And I agree, to some degree. But what's the cumulative effect of thousands of sources of story through songs, through experiences, through marketing, through film that reinforce the narrative that if you aren't sexually or romantically satisfied, you're not a whole person? Like some of us right now in this moment are living into a story about the good life or about romance that doesn't actually map over reality. It's been served up to you by storytellers who want to make you feel something but care, care nothing about who you're becoming. Just think about the stories, because we're story creatures. Like for our brains to make sense of the complexity of life in this world, we organize the world into mental maps or stories. And we tell stories or we live into stories. And, and now we're not just talking about media we consume, but also just the experiences we've had, the family we grew up in. So for example, you believe a story about money. You do. About what it's for, about what it does to you, its ability to bring about happiness in your life, why having more could be good or less could be bad. A story. And the question that followers of Jesus want to ask is, does that story map over the story that Jesus tells about money? What is this Jesus story about money? And if you want to know what Christians believe, if you're here and you want to know what Christians believe, we believe that the most accurate map of reality is found in Jesus Christ. That at the center of the universe is a loving God who made this world. And that in him is truth to find full life in this world and power and redemption and new life. And so when it comes to the stories that we have taken in, they've formed us. And then the question we have to ask is, what are they forming us into? We're shaped by relationships, by habits, by stories, by so many things, by our experiences. I couldn't overstate this. Your mountaintop experiences and your most traumatic, crushing experiences and all the million of experiences in between have shaped you. And this has all happened over time. We're formed through all these things. And the question we want to ask is, what are all these things forming us into? Question number two. What are you being formed into? Did you notice during the pandemic as the news cycles ramped up, as the social media algorithms ramped up, and people were isolated by community, did you notice the increase in anxiousness, anger, rage, suspicion of others, resentfulness, hopelessness, cynicism? Did you notice that in people that you loved? Did you notice that within you? It was a staggering moment over the course of a number of months that we saw ourselves and others change and we could point to the stimuli. See, so often in life it's hard to go, where are these, because it's so complex. So, you know, I'm giving a simplified model, but it's so much more complex than I'm making it sound. But all of a sudden, people are stripped from their community, they're placed in a silo, they're dependent on news and social media to find the plot points, and those agencies are incentivized to create addictive behavior by ramping up the fear, the anger, the partisanship, so that you will come back for more. And we watched it change us. And the sad thing is that there's many people in our city who years later are still jaded, cynical, and untrusting. What are you being formed into? Like, what is the sum effect of the formative work in your lives? One thing that's very encouraging amongst Gen Z is how awake they are to the power of social media and smartphones. And this isn't just true of that generation. It's true across the board. There is, like, an awakening. It's a small minority right now, but it's growing of people saying, like, you know what? I'm opting out. I don't have to live my life in this space. I see what it's doing to me. I don't want to be edgy. I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to be critical of everyone else. So I'm going to reject those formative 
influences. And it's a small minority, but it's a growing minority. And the reason why they're saying no to those things, because the data is in. This stuff is making people anxious, depressed. It's savage, particularly on young minds. And so the response is, I don't want to be formed into somebody that's cynical, depressed, edgy, and anxious. And so then where do you stick the target of your formation if not towards those things? I don't want to be that. And this is the heart of followers of Jesus. The bullseye for the life of a follower of Jesus is Jesus himself. When you answer the question, like, what do I want to be formed into? Jesus. That's the bullseye. And then you audit and edit the ways of your life to ask, are these forming me into that outcome? Yesterday at Serve Team Day, we looked at Philippians chapter 2, which begins by saying, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude as Christ. The formative goal, the outcome, the bullseye, Jesus Christ. And to become like Jesus is not to lose your own personhood, but to take on the character, the traits, the ethics, and values of Jesus within your own skin and bones. Distinctly you more like you than you ever could be as you increasingly become more and more like Jesus. A number of years ago, I was on an annual retreat. I probably mentioned to you guys this before. Part of my pattern of life is once a year to get away for a few days and to look back on the year and look forward on the year ahead. I find it almost impossible in my day-to-day life to gain any sort of perspective on my life, to actually look critically on how I spend my time because all the demands and the minutiae of life just seems to sort of just get me in what feels like the river at the base of Chatterbox Falls. And so I step out of the river for a bit to look at the river and ask how might I rearrange the pieces of my life. And one morning, we, I usually each morning go for a long walk and I try to pray, and I was trying to wrestle with big life decisions. What should I do? How should I, where should our family, how, you know, big life questions about where we should live and how I could organize my job and my work. I'm asking these big questions. And I felt so overwhelmed that I just needed to say, just stop. And so I grabbed my audio Bible, I had my phone handy, and I put my headphones in and I just listened to the Sermon on the Mount. And as I was listening to the Sermon on the Mount, I just began to hear, like just with clarity, I just began to hear this, this vision of the life of a follower of Jesus. Well, actually, I, I caught a, a portrait of Jesus. And I, ha- I had that held before me. And listen to the, this is the language of the Sermon on the Mount, just in the three chapters in Matthew. As I listen, this, these exhortations to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be a peacemaker, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to not be driven by the approval of others, to be eternally minded, to become Christ-like, to be salt and light in this world, to be slow to anger, to seeing others with great value and dignity, to be an agent of reconciliation, to be sexually pure and devoted to my wife, to be a truth teller, to be a keeper of my word, to be merciful and not vengeful, to love, to have love towards my enemy, to present, um, to trust to trust God, to to be non-anxious, to be generous, self-sacrificing, prayerful, living to please God, self-control, not cynical, not judgmental, generous in spirit towards others. This list began to grab a hold of my imagination. I'm like, this is my life goal. Like as a follower of Jesus, this invitation which paints a portrait of Jesus is also an invitation to, that's how I want to live my life, to read the Sermon on the Mount in the context of the whole story of God and say, this is true north, for my formation. This is the bullseye. And this is what the spirit of the living God wants to form in me and you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead wants to do a metamorphosis in your heart and mind to make us not like the patterns of this world, but to follow the way of Jesus. Last question. Are you intentional about your formation. As I said, it's so rare that we pause, that we stop to consider how are or how does the way in which my life is organized form me? Have you had a chance to pause recently and consider this? And I guess a more hope-filled question alongside of that is how might I partner with the work of the Holy Spirit in my life who wants to form me 
into the way of Jesus. And this is really important. What we're talking about is not the work of human effort, but is a work of the Spirit. The Spirit of God works within us to form us into the person of Christ. This is why Paul, to the church, or in the letter of Galatians, says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what the Spirit wants to give birth to, not from the outside in, but from the core of who we are out. But we are not passive bystanders to that process. We can join in on and yield to the work of the Holy Spirit through submitting to his work in our lives and intentionally engaging in counterformative practices in the same way that the rhythms and stories and habits and relationships form us, so the practices of Jesus invite us to partner with the profound work of the Holy Spirit to form us into the way of Jesus. This is the preview for next week. Next week, what we want to talk about are counterformative practices that connect us deeply with Jesus that anchor us in God's redemptive story, that invite the Holy Spirit to work on our lives, and that form us as a whole person, mind, body, and spirit, around what is true about Jesus and our identity in him. But as a free preview, let me give some examples. Ask yourself, what difference could it make to begin your day with praying Psalm 23 before grabbing your phone and checking the news? For the first words in your mind to be, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Consider the difference practicing a weekly day of rest like Sabbath could have to counterform against the culture of hustle and busyness in our city. Or consider how the practice of fasting and the effect it could have on us against the culture of consumption and instant gratification that we were born into. And all these practices we want to explore find their origin in the life of Jesus. We see Jesus with his life having counterformative practices that tether him deeply to the love of the Father, the power of the Spirit, and the truth of God's word. But all of that is next week. <laughs> this is how we'll end today. In preparation, I was rereading the book, Practicing the Way. And I'm going to pull a quote out of the beginning of the book um, that it addresses later. So I just want to be clear, I'm not misusing this quote. But listen to this quote. Spiritual formation is not optional. Every thought you think, every emotion you let shape your behavior, every attitude you let rest in your body, every decision you make, each word you speak, every relationship you enter into, the habits that make up your days, how you respond to pain and suffering, how you handle failure or success, all these things and more are forming us into a particular shape. That's overwhelming. That's a bit much for me. I don't know about you, but when I really go down this train... And I begin to think that every thought I have, every story I take in, every relationship I hold is forming me. I can spiral. I can spiral into one of two primary emotions. One is an emotion of shame, and the other is an emotion of overwhelm. And I just want to speak to anyone here who might be feeling either of those things. Let me speak first to shame. You know, when we become aware of all that we've done or consider what's been done to us, which has malformed us, it can be a natural human response to feel shame. The sense that I've blown it. And not just I've blown it, but I'm the kind of person who blows it. How can I begin to climb this mountain? And somehow by hearing this invitation to partner with the Holy Spirit, instead of feeling hopeful optimism about the future, you can feel self-hate and criticism about where you are in the present. And this is intensified because many of us have grown up around religious frameworks, directly or indirectly, that trade on the currency of shame. Jesus does not trade in the currency of shame. 
he trades in the currency of love. Shame is a great short-term motivator, but it is a terrible source of transformation. Love is transforming and can lead to lasting change. And this is why in Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, and as a pastor in your life, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to take this conversation in view of God's mercy. Like, all of this energy turns our eyes towards our lives as a project to solve. And Paul says, lift up your eyes. See his mercy. See his mercy. This offering of our lives for Paul, this offering of our whole selves as worship, is not a way to earn God's love. It's a response to it. See, the message of Christianity is that we love God because he first loved us. God so loved the world that he gave. Before we had a good thought in our mind or body, God gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And through his son Jesus, he shows us mercy. That while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the debt of our shame. He took our shame on the cross. So we need not stand in shame. He bore it. And when we get a glimpse of that, like when there's a moment of clarity and the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see how sufficient the sacrifice of Jesus was, how generous the sacrifice and love he displayed for you and I, how capable his finished work on the cross is to cleanse us of sin, shame, and unrighteousness. When you get a glimpse of that, it melts your heart. It melts your heart. And the natural response is to offer up our lives to the living sacrifice. Love is a much better motivator than shame. And that's why we take communion every week, among other reasons is to re-engage with all of our senses, a profound formative practice to get our eyes on his mercy and to live the rest of our lives in response to that. So that's shame. What about overwhelm? The second feeling that I often have is overwhelm. Where do I begin? How do I handle that? My life is a mess. Where do I start? And the second reality that we need to hold in mind as we go on this journey is that the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in your life and my life, forming us into the image of Jesus. This is what the Spirit of God wants to do and is doing. You are God's workmanship. God is the great gardener, pruning and shaping our souls into a masterpiece that will give him glory. It's impossible to become like Christ. Listen to me. It's impossible to become like Christ through any number of habits or formative decisions unless the supernatural power of God is at work within us. It's impossible. Like when I think about the formative power of Vancouver or Rome, we don't stand a chance. But the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in those who profess Jesus as Lord. It's one of the gifts of becoming a Christian, the spirit of God indwells us when we turn from our old way and trust into Jesus and follow him and we make him our Lord and our guide not ourselves we're caught up in the miraculous work of the spirit of God from death to life from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light and so when we bring our limited human effort to the table we're met by the incredible power of the Holy Spirit so today as we consider this journey of spiritual formation, let us do it in view of God's mercy, in view of the finished work of Jesus that saves us. And let's do it on the foundation and dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. We hope that that message was strengthening for your heart, drew you deeper into the love of God. If you wanna find more messages or resources like this, you can find it at thewaychurch.ca and we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out anytime. Lots of love. Bye for now.